Well, if you've got your Bibles, I want to invite you to go ahead and open up to John 13. If you are a guest this morning, uh, back in January, we started a journey going through the Gospel of John, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. I know many of you have been reading through this devotional. Many of you have also been gathering together in your life group, having some conversation uh, about this, and uh, what a great journey it has been. And uh, we've gotten to the point in time where uh, we're at the very end of Jesus' life. Uh, it's been three and a half years of public ministry. Um, we've looked at uh, Jesus having a meal with his disciples. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we looked at uh, foot washing, where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And then last Sunday, uh, Jim Pitzer shared with us a little bit about Judas. And uh, thank you, Jim, for sharing about Judas. You just seemed really natural talking about Judas. I don't know what it was, but uh, it was awesome. Uh, it's great to have uh, uh, wonderful preachers uh, to be able to just um, dwell in God's Word. And so we come to the point immediately following. Jesus dips the, the, the bread um, and then gives it to Judas. Judas gets, stands up, walks out of the room. And this is where we pick up in John 13, beginning with verse 31 this morning. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads as we have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a beautiful day, for time in your word, for the gathering of your people, for an opportunity, Lord, to consider this love that you demonstrate on the cross, a love that the world has never known, a love that we continue to wrestle with and struggle with, to just imagine how much you love us. And so God, as we wrestle through and go through this verse this morning, these verses this morning, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, the 1960s in the United States of America were fraught with tension, with division, with anger, with hatred. There was all sorts of tension around us, for those of you who are alive. I was born in the 1960s. You may recall the 1960s, the Vietnam War had been escalating for about 10 to 15 years. There were protests on college campuses. There was racial tension. The 1960s, a president of the United States was assassinated. And of course, the 1960s, MLK Jr., a leader in the civil rights movement, was also assassinated. Fires around cities, violence, drugs, rock and roll. It was a crazy time, the 1960s in America. People were terrified that the communists were going to take over. And so perhaps it's no surprise that in 1965, April 15th, Liberty, Liberty Records released a song sung by Jackie DeShannon. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. What the world needs now is love. Sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. Some of you know that song. You can hear the melody playing. And I think Jackie DeShannon, in many ways, the, the sentiment of that song, I think she's absolutely right. What the world needs is love. Because here we are, 50 years later, and the world is still, our nation is still filled with division, with anger, with hatred, with violence. It could go on and on. I don't think we've come any further along than we have since the 1960s towards this aspiration. In fact, we might have even regressed a little bit. But I still think her sentiment is right. We need love, sweet love. And the thing is, I know many of us have tried We've tried to love others. We've struggled to love others. But with this world of technology, now we can see lots and lots of bad news, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's exhausting. It's wearing us out, no matter how much we love. It's, it's kind of like 
you know, we try to just do good, and, and no matter how much we good, it's, it feels like it's pouring a little bit of water in the ocean. It's like, what's the point? We're not making a hill of beans difference, right? I feel like throwing up the white flag, surrender, I'm done loving. It's just too hard. So this is the context in which we live. We've got this thing now called even compassion fatigue, where we're tired, we're worn out. We're exhausted by trying to love others, by trying to be compassionate with others. So we're going to talk about love today, because the world still needs love, sweet love. To be very clear, disclaimer, disclosure here, spoiler, the kind of love that Jesus is talking about, that he teaches that he demonstrates is very different than the world's definition of love. So let's pick it up, John 13, beginning with verse 31. When he was gone, meaning Judas, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. Judas has just left the room. And Jesus immediately starts talking about his glory and being glorified. And if you've ever been in the room where there's lots and lots of tension immediately before this, Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And everybody's like, uh-oh, this is tense, this is awkward, and everybody's very, very nervous. And so when he gives the piece of bread to Judas, Judas gets up and leaves. The tension in the room just drops. Have you ever been at a gathering of people where that, there's just that one person in the room who makes everything so uncomfortable, everybody is so tense, everybody is just on edge. And they leave the room and it's just like, whew. That's what's happening. Judas has left the room, and everybody is breathing a sigh of relief. Let's stop talking about those who betray us from now on. And Jesus changes the, top, the subject, the topic. He says, I'm going to talk about glory, my glory. Now God is going to glorify me. And, and in these, just these two verses, Jesus uses this word glory or glorify five times. And then the disciples, they're thinking to themselves, this is awesome. We got rid of that guy, the betrayer. And they're thinking to themselves, we're going to talk about Jesus' glory now, which is amazing and wonderful. And this is what we'd much rather talk about. They're thinking to themselves, Jesus is going to go to the temple. He's going to overthrow the Romans as the Messiah. There's going to be this great political victory. He's going to be on the throne. He's going to be the new king, kick out the Romans. We're going to be his court of honor, and we're going to walk alongside him. There's going to be this new kingdom of God. It's going to be awesome and amazing. So they get very, very excited as Jesus is talking about his glory. Now, you and I, we know how this story ends. We actually know what transpires over the next 24 hours. And we read this text very differently than how the disciples experienced this teaching of Jesus. Because we know that over the next 24 hours, Jesus is, uh, just in a matter of hours, he's going to be arrested. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be tried. He's going to be flogged. He's going to be beaten some more. And he's going to be condemned to die on a cross. And he's going to be shamed as he walks out carrying a cross that thing on which he's going to be executed. And in just a matter of hours, Jesus is going to be hanging on a cross. And so for, for the disciples, they're excited. I think for the rest of us who know the end of the story or how this goes or what's, what's going to transpire, it feels a little bit dubious. It feels a little bit like what in the world is Jesus talking about? Why would he be talking about his glory? It doesn't really sound like glory, torture, an execution, and being shamed, and hung on a cross to die. Where's the glory in that? 
And what I want to remind you this morning is that what the kind of glory Jesus is talking about is not the kind that, that men are going to glorify him. It's he is going to be glorified through what he does for us. What they do to him is a horrible thing. No glory in that. But to be clear, Jesus dying on the cross for you and for me, that is a great glory that he is talking about here. A great glory of love that God is going to demonstrate. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so now I tell you, where I am going, you cannot come. The disciples are like, what? Wait, 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 wait. This is not the plan. You're going to go into Jerusalem. You're going to usher in the kingdom of God. We're going with you. What do you mean? We can't come with you. We're supposed to be in, the, in positions of power. We're supposed to be the up-and-coming muckety-mucks walking alongside you. What do you mean we can't come with you? And now all of a sudden the disciples are confused in this teaching. And then Jesus continues, verse 34. A new command I give you. And the disciples are thinking to themselves, a new command. We know that there are 613 commandments in the Old Testament. Get out your pens. We got a new one, folks. And they know all the other commandments. They're like, what's it going to be? This is awesome. And they're thinking, and so, so Peter and, and Matthew and Bartholomew and John, they got their pens and they're like, oh, wait just a second. Okay, oh, oh, okay go, go ahead, Jesus. A new command. What is it? Love one another. The disciples are like, okay. No, that's it. Love one another. They're like, that's not a new commandment. Loving one another is all over the place in the Bible. Loving one another is all over in the Old Testament. That's not a new commandment. That's an old commandment. What are you talking about, Jesus? What Jesus is talking about in this new commandment is he is lifting up, he is summarizing the entire Old Testament, the entire law. And the disciples knew. Immediately when, they hear, when Jesus says, love one another, they're thinking Leviticus 19.18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against any one among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. We know this, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the Old Testament, folks. The disciples knew that. We know that. Jesus is, and so when he says, love one another, what in the world is he talking about? He's just elevating. He's summarizing the entire Old Testament. He's summarizing the Ten Commandments. He's summarizing the law. And if you think about it for just a moment, love one another is actually a summary of all Ten Commandments. Because if you love God, you will have no other gods before you. If you love God, you will not take God's name in vain. If you love God, you'll be like, hey, it's Sabbath, let's keep it holy. And if you love people, you're going to honor your mother and father. If you love people, you're not going to kill. If you love people, you will not steal. See where this is going? If you love people, you will not lie. If you love people, you will not covet. We could look at all Ten Commandments and just have a sermon on the Ten Commandments and how they are God's love letter to God's people. All Ten Commandments are grounded and rooted in love. And so Jesus says, love one another. He's summarizing what it means to be followers of God, followers of Jesus Christ. And so he's offering his last will and testament because he says he's going away. He says, I got one more commandment for you. Love one another. And what I love about this teaching with this text is just these few verses. is Jesus tells us what to do. He tells us how to do it. And if we don't like that, if that's not good enough, he tells us why we need to do it. He tells us what, he tells us how, and he tells us why. 
Don't you wish your boss told you what to do, how to do it, and why to do it? If you're a little bit unclear, if you're a little bit fuzzy? Don't you wish your parents, you know, if they say, go clean your room, okay, they've told you what to do. Don't you wish they told you how to do it and why you need to do it? I mean, I could go on and on. There's just something wonderful, something beautiful about the clarity of Jesus' teaching. He tells us what to do, how to do it, and why to do it. And don't you wish God just came to you, showed up at your house, and said, I'm going to tell you what to do, how to do it, and why to do it. Wouldn't it be awesome if you had that kind of clarity from God? Well, he's going to give us that clarity this morning in these verses. He's just told us what? Love one another. And now we're going to shift into how to do it and why to do it. So let's look at how. Next, next, keep going here. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So what's the how? As I have loved you. Now, we need to take just a little bit of time here this morning and just pause and think about how Jesus' definition of love contrasts with the world's definition of love. This is where things go get very, very different. How Jesus defines love, how the Bible defines love, and how the world defines love. This is what it makes all the difference in the world for you as Jesus followers. Because we all use this word over and over and over. Everybody uses the word love. But as Jesus followers, as Christians, we have a very different, different definition of love than the world's definition of love. Jesus intentionally is very specific about what love looks like so that we aren't confused. So I just want to talk a little bit about the world's definition of love. And I, I was thinking of, you know, what would be a good way to kind of just, you know, what, what does the world's definition of love look like? And I've seen these signs around. They popped up in the past few years. Maybe you've seen them too. And the world's definition of love, I think, is just kind of what's on one of these printed signs out in somebody's yard or somewhere online. Love is love is love. Have you seen those signs? Love is love is love. Now you're going to start seeing those signs around. And you're like, what in the world does that mean? Love is love is love. That's the world's definition of love. And I think one of the problems, I think, with love is love is love is that it's patronizing. I think when we say love is love is love, it's as if love is so easy. Love is so simple. You just got to love somebody, right? Isn't that implied in that statement? Love is love is love. It's just so simple. I think whoever came up with that slogan has never been married. I think whoever came up with that slogan has never had children. Can I get an amen? Amen. I think whoever came up with that slogan has no friends. Because love is not easy. Love is some of the most difficult things that we do as we live on this planet. And the statement, oh, come on, we just got to love people, right? Oh, if it were so easy. Love is love is love. It's the definition that the world just kind of throws out there. It says, it is so easy. It reminds me of that Peanuts cartoon where Linus and Lucy are going back and forth, and she's getting really frustrated with Linus. And finally, just to kind of prove herself and just to, to, to kind of, uh, you know, make it known that she is a loving person. She says, I love mankind. I just don't love the people. <laughs> I love the wisdom, the theology of Charles Schultz, who never was afraid to put his Christian faith out there in his comic strips. Because I think he nails it in terms of what's going on in the world's definition of love. 
let's be honest. Love is hard. Love is really, really difficult. And for those who argue or say that it's not, if it's as simple as love is love is love, they're liars. And they're not living into what true love is all about. I think the other thing about the idea of love is love is love is that any educator will tell you, you cannot define a word by itself. That's just intellectually dumb. You can't do it. Any educator will tell you, you can't do that. A word cannot be defined by itself. But really, I think what people who say love is love is love, what they are really talking about, the modern definition of love is tolerance. Tolerance has become almost a virtue today in our society, in our world. And I was trying to think of how I could explain to you uh, what tolerance looks like. And so I've got a bar here, or a poll this morning, and I need a volunteer who could help me with this uh, demonstration. Hey, thanks for putting your hand up, Tim. I appreciate that. You never have to <laughs> worry about a volunteer when Tim Moore is in the congregation. So what I'm going to do is have, Tim, this is, this is a bar, and this is the love bar, okay? And, and, and love, you, you have to step over the love bar, okay? And, and what tolerance the world's definition of love actually does is it lowers the standard. Go ahead, Tim, step over. Can we give him applause? Oh, yay. That's and awesome, a Tim. Back and forth. That's really the world's definition of love. We are going to so lower the bar, lower the expectation for what it means to love. Tolerance means just put up with. It just means accept whatever other people say, whatever their other belief is. And you can just step over it so easy. And the thing about tolerance is it's passive. You don't have to do anything. You're just like, oh, okay, whatever you say. Whatever you believe, I'm going to accept that. I'm going to affirm that. That's what tolerance is. And so as the world tries to tell you that being tolerant is really raising the bar, when you think about it, it's actually lowering the bar for what it means to love. Because love and tolerance, as the world defines it, has so lowered the bar that there is no expectation on any of you. It's like, all right, whatever, man. You be you, I'll be me. We'll just all agree. That's the world's definition of love. It's found in moralism. Relative moralism, philosophers tell us. Just whatever you believe. Whatever your truth is, is there is no truth in relativism. Because whatever you think, whatever you believe, that's your truth. And all truth, because there is no ultimate truth in relativism, it's all the same. It's all in your mind. So this is what the world's definition has got us today, a really low bar. So we're going to contrast that. Thanks, Tim. You can go ahead and sit down. We're going to contrast that a little bit with Jesus' definition of love. I think it's important to just kind of lay that out there so that we can really understand what Jesus is talking about. You know, one other thing I want to say uh, about the world's definition of love is, you know, it's really based on sentimentality. It's, it's based on feelings. It's based on emotions. And so as we think about that, you might be thinking to yourself, well, what, you know, how, how does a person, you know, communicate their love in the world today? Well, it's, it's sentimental, right? It's through um, ooey-gooey. It's through warm fuzzies. It's through nice thoughts, nice feelings. You might even say it's like a, like a love letter. But I want to encourage you this morning to think a little bit about this more. Did you know the longest love letter ever written was in 1875? A guy by the name of Marcel Delacour he wrote a love letter to his girlfriend, Magdalene Dia de Via Lori. And on this love letter, he just wrote the words, I love you. 
uh, 875 times. It was 1875. So a thousand times for every year. And, and so just page after page after page. 1,875 times. I love you. I love you. I love you. And I mean, at some point in time, if you're reading that love letter, like, I, I get it. Right? And I mean, it, it, is that love? That he wrote the world's longest love letter? Actually, his secretary wrote most of it. But he gets credited for being the longest love letter in the world. Or maybe you're thinking, well, maybe it's not just words. Maybe, maybe it's, you know, physical touch. Maybe it's some kind of physical action that we do. And, and so I thought, well, maybe I'll look up and see what the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest kiss is. Anybody want to know what the longest kiss is? No? I thought you did. I'm going to share it with you anyways. A husband and wife, London, England. 2005, locked lips, 31 hours, 32 minutes. I think that's gross. I don't think his secretary did this, this time around. Is that love? The longest kiss in the world. It's in the Guinness Book of World Records. You can look it up. Is that love? I, I, I just think that's gross. I think it's just... Nasty. I don't, I don't know why people do that, but, but this is the world's definition of love. It's through words, it's through actions, it's, it's through physical touch, it's through feelings, it's through emotion. Jesus rejects this definition of love. This is what he says. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. How did Jesus love us? Well, just a few minutes ago, he was washing their nasty feet. The job assigned to slaves. How did Jesus love his disciples? In a matter of hours, he was going to die and hang on a cross for them. He was going to give his very life for them. How did Jesus love? He says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Jesus defined love in service. Jesus defined love in action. Jesus defined love very, very specifically. And if, if, if uh, the bar was low for the world's definition of love, what Jesus is talking, I don't know about you, but if I were to say to you this morning, you need to love one another as I have loved you. By the way, I'm washing feet after worship this morning. By the way, after worship today, I'm going to go die for you. That's a pretty high bar as it relates to Jesus' definition of love. So this morning, I want to just kind of pick at this a little bit and give you what I think are three ways as I look through the New Testament in Jesus' life in terms of how he loves one another. The first way is Jesus loves proactively. He doesn't wait for you to clean yourself up. He doesn't wait for you to become lovable. He initiates the relationship. He comes to you even while you are still a sinner. Romans 5.8, the Apostle Paul writes this, but God demonstrates his own love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. He preempts any kind of relationship that you might want to have with him. He's in advance. He proactively comes to you. He says, you don't need to be washed up. I'm just going to love you and serve you. Think about this. There's a, there's a 12 disciples here. One of them's going to betray him. One's going to deny him. And one's going to say, I doubt it. And they're all there. That meal. And how does Jesus respond to them? He washes their feet. He knows they're going to betray him. He knows they're going to deny him. He knows that they're going to walk away from him, every single one of them. And yet he still washes their feet. It's this preemptive, proactive, this love that, 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 that takes all the initiative. Jesus' love is act. It's not passive. It's not passive. It's not based on emotions. It's based on on action, which is number two. Jesus loves actively. Jesus' love is a verb. Jesus' love does. 
Jesus' love is a decision, even though he doesn't feel like it. And oftentimes we think to ourselves, well, you know, I, I don't feel love. Well, do you think Jesus felt like washing nasty feet? But he did it anyways. Well, I don't feel like loving them. Do you think Jesus felt like going and being flogged and beaten? Of course not. I don't feel like it. You think Jesus felt like hanging on a cross? See, Jesus takes feelings out of the equation. That's his definition of love. He looks at us and says, I don't care how you feel about it. Love is a demonstration of action. It's obedience to God. It's obedience to God's word. Folks, do you hear how different this definition of God's love, of Jesus' love, is than the, the definition of the world? I mean, I've been to several weddings this summer, and, and, and as I've been to these weddings, i got another one coming up in the fall. I see these young brides and grooms getting ready to get married. And we talk about love in the premarital counseling session, and, you know, they're going to talk about love in the ceremony. It's just all this ooey-gooey, feels good. And those of us who are married are like, yeah, give it time. About a year. Sometimes I don't feel like loving my wife. Sometimes I don't feel like loving my kids. Sometimes I don't feel like loving you. What do feelings have to do with love? For Jesus, they don't have anything to do with love. Love is a decision. Love is an action. Love actually manifests itself when we act, when we do something, even though we don't feel like it. And all the married people are like, yep, I get it. You ever heard somebody say, well, we just fell out of love? To which I think, no, you didn't. You chose to stop loving. Love is not a feeling. According to Jesus, love is an action. Love is a decision in spite of how we're feeling. Which leads me to number three. Jesus loves unconditionally. Isn't that good news? I don't care what kind of sins you've committed before you came to worship today. I don't care what kind of sins you've committed in your life, the ways in which you've walked from God. He still loves you. And no matter how much you run from God, how much you try and get away from God, it doesn't matter. He still loves you. There is nothing you can do that God will say, ah, I don't love you anymore. That's too much. Too offensive. It's not God. The Bible tells us that he loves us unconditionally. No matter what sins, no matter what mistakes, no matter what we've done wrong, Jesus says, I love you. Come to me, repent of your sins, and I will forgive you. Let's make this relationship right. Jesus loves you unconditionally. He loved his disciples unconditionally. Even the guy who was in the process of betraying him at the time. And no matter how many times you run away from God, no matter how many times you sin, Jesus is going to keep loving you. He's going to keep chasing you down. You ever had kids, um, you know, and they, they, they make a mistake, they do something wrong, you call them out on it, they're like, okay, I'll do better. And then the next day they do the same thing or something different but similar. I mean, aren't kids frustrating? Because no matter how much we tell them what they're supposed to do, how they're to live their lives, they keep doing it wrong. And maybe you've even thought to yourself or maybe even said it out loud. I keep telling you the same thing over and over and over and you keep doing it wrong. A anybody or just me? <laughs> and then you come to church on Sunday morning. And if I give God the microphone this morning, he would say, how many times do I have to tell you? You keep doing it wrong. Over and over, I have to keep telling you what's wrong with you. <laughs> I mean, we're just like kids, right? But I don't think God would say that to any of us. God's like, yep, you messed up again. I still love you. You messed up again. 
Come on, give me a hug. I need you to repent of your sin. Let's make this relationship right. So Jesus has talked about what we need to do as Christ followers. We need to love. He's talked about this idea, this, this, this concept where the bar is so high. So this is how you need to love. Sacrificially. Even when you don't feel like it. Even when it's inconvenient. And I need you to forgive and love others over and over and over. Not passively, but always initiating, always being active. And, and the disciples are like, oh my goodness. That's a pretty high bar for love. And now Jesus is going to tell us why we need to love. Verse 35. By this, meaning love, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's why. It becomes our witness in the world. It becomes our testimony in the world. Now for the Jewish people... Love was not the thing, the defining mark, the, 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 the sign that kind of set them apart. See, if you were to ask people in ancient times, what is the defining thing that sets Jewish people apart? They would say circumcision, temple worship, and the law, the Torah. That's what made a Jewish person a Jewish person. Jesus says that's not it, to be a Jesus follower. Your defining mark... What's going to make you a Christian, what's going to make you known in the world, is how you love, as Jesus has defined love. Not as the world defines love, how Jesus defines love. And I got to tell you, it was love which made the early church absolutely explode. It was love and the behavior of the early Christians that made the church, that people are like, these guys are different. They are really different. How did the early church, how did the early Christians practice this love that Jesus is talking about? Number one is they cared for the poor and the vulnerable. They looked around in society and said, who are the, the most vulnerable people in society? They saw the poor, they saw the disabled, they saw the widows and orphans, and they said, we're just going to love and care for those people. In society of the day, it was just like, ah, they kind of deserve it. They made some bad decisions. They're sinners. Let them go. And the Christian said, nope. We're going to love as Jesus has called us to love. Actively, we're going to step out of our comfort zone. We're going to give generously. We're going to give up our finances. We're going to give of our time. We're going to do what's not comfortable. We're not going to feel like hanging out with the vulnerable of society. We're going to do it because this is the kind of love that Jesus is talking about. So that's why the, the, the society around them, they're like, holy smokes. These Christians, they are something else. They are really different than the world. I want some of that. There is something different about them. So the early church, they took care of the vulnerable. But the second thing they did that contrasted them starkly with the world is they made human relationships, the family, as being so important. They put boundaries in human relationships. One man, one woman, one lifetime. See, we think to ourselves today, oh, we've, we've kind of lowered the bar, lowered the expectations, all, all these human relationships today. It's, 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 there's so many categories, so many things going on. Folks, it was that way in ancient times as well. We think, oh, but now we've got all these gender categories. They had that in ancient times as well. What we are living through right now is nothing new. In fact, they had a, a culture in ancient time of tolerance. Live and let live. Hey, men, you're married, so what? There's a, there's a, a brothel down the street. Well, we're not going to judge them because the, the boundaries for human relationships, for the marriage relationship were so loose in ancient times. You just do whatever you want. People engaged in all sorts of relationships like they do today. It's like, yeah, you do you, I'm going to do me, and we're not going to judge each other. That's ancient culture. 
But what the Christian said is we're going to love like Jesus loves, and that means we're going to define the relationship in terms of what it looks like. Guys, knock it off. Stop having relationships outside of your, rela outside of your marriage. Stop looking at stuff that you shouldn't be looking at. And the world saw this. Like, whoa, human relationships, family relationships, that's really different. I want some of that. Those people are loving in a different way than the world loves. I, I, I find it just amazing how society and culture just continues to repeat itself over and over. There's nothing new under the sun that we're living through here, folks. And so we, we live in this culture. It's everybody do whatever you want. And we as Jesus followers, we're leaning against that culture saying, we're going we're gonna to live according to how Jesus has taught us. We're going to live according to what the Bible says. Amen? Amen. Man. And you might be thinking to yourself this morning, that sounds really hard. And it is. You might be thinking, I don't know if I can love my spouse that way. I don't know if I can love my kids that way. I, I, or is it just me? I mean, this is a sacrificial love unconditionally. I'm just going to forgive my spouse, my kids, no matter what they do, over and over and over. You're just like, yeah, I like to hold a grudge. They've really hurt me. I don't, I don't, I don't want to forgive them. But Jesus is like, now nah, you got to forgive them. This is what I've done for you. No matter how much you've sinned, no matter how bad your sins were, I forgave you. Now you got to go sin. And, and so we read this text and the bar is so high and we're thinking to ourselves, I don't know if I can do that. Verse 36. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Lie. In the moment, he's going to deny him. Oh, he'll eventually lay down his life. Peter doesn't know it at this point in time. He's actually a prophet. He will lay down his life, but, but not now, not anytime soon. Jesus replies, very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times, and yet I'm still going to love you. And so the bar is so high, and we think to ourselves, I can't do that. How in the world, as a Christ follower, can I do that? And so I've got some good news for you this morning. I want you to hear these words. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 5, God's love, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. In other words, you can't love as Jesus has called us to love one another. But we can love through the power of the Holy Spirit. So when your love tank is empty, you just go, God, I need some more love. And he says he will give you that love. You can't love as Jesus has called you to love, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we got to wait for it. we got to pray for it. We have to open ourselves up and say, God, I need love. I can't do this. The bar is too high to love as you've called me to love. And the Apostle Paul says, through my strength, through my spirit, you can actually do this. I think that's good news. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you um, that you are a God who didn't just talk about love in some ooey-gooey, feely, touchy-feely, vague way. But that, God, you showed us love in a very specific way. In a way that demonstrates action a way that demonstrates sacrifice, a way that is so hard for each one of us. And yet, God, you give us a way to love in that same way. And God, if it were up to me, I would have just lowered the bar. If I were you, I would have just been like, all right, I'm going to give you a really low definition of love. But you were like, nah, I'm going to give them a definition of love that they can't do that they can't accomplish without a free gift of the Holy Spirit to them. And so, God, thank you for making the bar high. Thank you for having expectations of us, for boundaries for us. 
God, thank you for making a way through your son, Jesus Christ, that we can indeed love others, even when we don't feel like it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer.